Well, hello, I'm Nathan, if I haven't met you before. It's nice to meet you, especially the new faces here. It's lovely to be together. Um, actually, before I start, I'd like to just pray. that uh, I, I feel very weak and just, in a sense, you know, God's word. We, we're handling God's word, and somehow we've got to communicate this to one another. And we just rely on his grace so much. We're talking some big themes here. Kingdom of God, heaven. And so I, I want, let me just pray. Let's pray for us all. Heavenly Father, I ask that right now your Holy Spirit would minister to each one of us. Lord, I long for us here now in the present to know what it is to know heaven on earth. Let your will come. Let your will be done. As it is in heaven. Lord, let your will come down now amongst us. Amen. The reason I say this is because I, my, my desire is that what I'm preaching on is that it would be really practical and it will change how we live each day. Um, and it's all about kind of living in light of the future and how having, living in light of the future changes right now. And it's sometimes hard to join the two together. Sometimes they're very separate. We talk of kingdom of God, we talk of heaven, and it's a very distant kind of separate thing. And I want it to be right here, present now, amongst us. So um, we, we say Happy New Year to everyone at this time. It's probably getting to the point in the month where we pre- need to stop saying Happy New Year because there's a bit of a danger that it might not have been such a good few weeks of the, and then people might turn around to you and say, is it really? And uh, they might hit your kind of buoyant optimism uh, with really. Eden, on the second day of January, he said to me, it's been a good year, hasn't it, Dad? I said, <laughs> yeah, two days in, we're doing well, son, this is good. Some of you may have made New Year's resolutions some plans for this next year. I myself have joined a gym, uh, firstly to get fit, but also to make some new friends. Ah, don't worry, it's not to replace you, it's an addition to you, (laughs) you're okay. But, uh, you know, I want want to make a change to my body and uh, get strong and flexible again. Now, you may have plans to, I don't know, go walking more, to eat less crisps and chocolate, eat more vegetables, drink more water, go to bed a bit earlier. Look, I've given you a few there to start with. But actually, these are all good and admirable, but um, we need to attend to our soul. And throughout the Bible, there's this sort of consistent message about not worrying about the present day, the here and now, what's on earth, but be alert to the future beyond 2023, even beyond, say, 100 years, where I imagine most of us will not be around. Attend now to your eternal self, what we call our soul. So I guess we could say that the Bible's anthem would be happy new eternity. This is where God is longing to be with us for eternity. To, to enjoy his presence, unbroken presence, to enjoy his pleasure, his goodness, his love, his blessing and favour. I believe we, we grow as disciples as we learn to live in the now and not yet tension of heaven and the kingdom of God. We experience glimpses of heaven now, but the fulfilment and the promise is to come. My happiness must come from the eternal, secure joy of the kingdom of God. The, 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 the world's pleasures are temporal, just for a moment. Let's fix our eyes on him. And so many of the songs that we sang this morning, Be Thou My Vision, My Inheritance Now and Always, Living Hope, It's About Now, 
and the future. And um, the passage that we're going to look at today is... Uh, it's got that sort of emphasis on the now and the future. We're going to look at the Beatitudes. Um, if you want to, you can turn on your phone uh, to Matthew 5, or if you've got a paper copy of the Bible, wow, you can have that too and look at that. So you can see that I'm reading from God's Word. It may be different. I'm going to read from the Good News Translation. Keith um, mentioned it. The word blessed could also be translated happy. And so this is what... The Bible says about how you are to be happy, how you're going to have a happy new eternity. So I'm going to read from Matthew 5, uh, verse 1. Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and began to teach them. So this is a very present, Jesus is present with the crowds, with the disciples. It's in the moment. Okay, he said to them about true happiness, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn, God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble, they will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart. They will see God. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you, because you are my followers. Be happy and glad, for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. Okay. You happy with that? So that is how you will have your happy new year. Let's have a look at some of the themes. I'm going to just pick out three themes. How do we remain in continue true happiness now and in the future. I think the first one is having a heavenly perspective, having a kingdom view. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 3 and verse 10 says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. It's present tense. We can enjoy the blessings of the kingdom now and in the future. We have a dual passport, don't we? Citizens of heaven and earth. I believe actually God has placed in the side of every man and woman eternity. It says that in Ecclesiastes. He set eternity in all of men, in all of men and women's hearts. This means that humans have this eternal sense in their soul, in their inner being, that there's something more than just this life. He's placed an awareness in our hearts of a different life beyond what we see here and now in the flesh. It is ours to receive and to enjoy. We're to live today in the light of the future. Matthew says this, it says, it regularly talks about living now, uh, sorry, living for the future. It talks in Matthew 6, 20, do not store up treasures, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys. So for a moment, how do, how do we think about the future? How do we have a heavenly perspective? I mean, for you guys now, what plans do you have to improve 2023? What plans do you have that you think might make you happy for this next year? You, you may think... Um, you need a new job. You need a new position in your workplace. Maybe you think you need a new body. That's going to make you happy. A new husband. New house, new clothes, a new phone. Maybe that's the thing that's going to make you happy this year. A new bank balance. We need to switch these things around. These are very earthly, immediate things in our lives. So let's think about a new job or position from a heavenly perspective. Because your position, according to Christ, if you're in Christ, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That's your position. 
That is your position. Your job, you're the light of the world. This is your role. You're ambassadors of Christ. You, you have the job of bringing the ministry of reconciliation to others. So that's your job and position. This is your heavenly perspective. New body. I tell you, you're the body of Christ. And one day, we'll have glory, resurrection, bodies when Christ returns. New husband. I want to tell you, if that is your goal for this year, first seek and live in the truth that you're betrothed to Christ. You are betrothed. You are wed to Christ. New house. As a people of God, we're a holy temple. We're a dwelling place for God. This is your heavenly perspective. New clothes. Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. This is your heavenly perspective. New phone. It's a bit tenuous, this. But because of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, you have direct access to God. You have direct access to the Father. You have a divine communication with the one who sits on the throne. This is your heavenly perspective. We may think happiness is directly affected by how rich we are, how, how we're eating, how we're dressed, how we're housed, how we're employed. I want to tell you, we need to shake off. Like Paul says, we have minds set on earthly things. It does not come from these things. It comes from him. The kingdom view comes from where we seat, where we're seated. It's not, it's not necessarily thinking less about earth. I really feel we, know, we don't need to try and think less about earth. I think we need to think more of heaven, more of his kingdom, more of the riches of heaven that we've received. Is he your highest treasure? Before um, Jesus shared the Sermon on the Mount to the crowds and his disciples, uh, moments before, he, he was um, tempted by the devil, and the devil came to him after a moment of real weakness. He'd been fasting for 40 days, and it says he was hungry. As an obvious statement, 40 days without food, he was hungry. And the enemy came and said, make these stones become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, bread is quite innocuous. It's quite an everyday thing. There's nothing wrong with bread in itself. But when you exchange it for the living words of God, for the heavenly perspective, it means everything. The enemy will continue to try to get you to exchange God's perfect kingdom for his counterfeit life. And, it, and I want you to be aware that it is, it is diametrically opposite to what he brings. It's life and death. Light, dark, truth, lie. So will you exchange the bread for the bread of life? He will try to get you at your weakest moment. And just as he did with Jesus. And uh, he'll try to get you to think that you can manipulate your world and change your destiny, your happiness, your value, your fate. Be masters of your own destiny. But by doing this, as you start to take control, you stop trusting God's perfect plan, his perfect timing, and the truth about what he says about your, your life in the kingdom now. Therefore, it's so important that we continue to meditate on heaven, continue to med meditate on the kingdom of God. As we, we, we want to live in the kingdom culture right now. We don't want to wait we, we want to do it right now. He is preparing an eternal, um, abiding happiness place for us to go, but we can enjoy this sense of joy and sense of belonging right now. Now, I'm just going to grab this. This is, a, this is a little illustration, which I actually pinched from someone else, um, Francis Chan. Imagine this ribbon is uh, your whole existence... 
Uh, it goes on. It doesn't just stop like you think at that table. It goes on. It goes through the, uh, through the bar, through the window. It actually goes right through across there, around the world, actually. It goes through into, into space, across galaxies. It's gone, this is eternity. This represents eternity. Okay? And this is your existence. And this little bit here, that's your existence on earth. That's just a little existence on earth, okay? And we spend a lot of time investing on this little bit here, don't we? We, we, we save all our money for retirement just so we can enjoy this little bit at the end of a few years and get a nice nest egg and a nice home. You know, we invest in relations. And it's not wrong, these things. But what I'm saying is your whole existence goes a lot longer. We need to be investing in the rest of this, all of this, not just in this little portion here. This period on earth. What you do on earth determines the rest of your existence. Did you know that? Don't get distracted by the things around you on earth. Paul says, press on, strain forward to what lies ahead, the upward call. That's what Jesus did. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. And this is what I want to try and bring to us. We need to have this heavenly perspective with us all the time because it will change how you behave each day. If you're just living for this bit here, you're not going to live the kingdom culture, the kingdom way you know, under his rule and under his reign. So that's the first thing. We need a heavenly perspective. The second thing, I, I, I've just put this, living our values every day. That's an acronym, love. We've used it before, love. Verse 10 says, happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those when people insult you. Oh, no, I won't read that one. I'll just read that top one. So happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. In God's kingdom economy, you are happy, blessed, and favoured if you're... Oh, actually, I'm very sorry, but someone has mucked up my, my notes. Look at that. I've just gone to the next one. Is that computer again? There we go, look at that. Okay, I'll carry on. It is about, uh, yeah, when you live your values every day, you are going to meet with persecution. And that's what it says. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. And then it repeats it in the second verse. I will repeat it. Happy are you when people insult you and per persecute you and tell all kinds of evil against you because you are my followers. If you do, if you follow what Jesus wants for you, you will be, find persecution. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. We are, in God's economy, happy when we're under persecution. Not because we're being persecuted, but because we're following what's right before God. And across this world, people are having been persecuted, under attack for their faith, for, you know, in so many different countries. According to Open Doors, which is a, a charity um, that supports the persecuted church, at least 360 million Christians around the world are experiencing high levels of persecution and discrimination. Uh, that's amazing. That's apparently about one in seven people uh, of the global Christian population. So we're, we're very fortunate here that we don't see that level of persecution. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher, said this, if you are what you profess to be, i.e. children of God, you are strangers. Don't expect the men of this world to treat you as one of themselves. If they do, be afraid. Dogs don't bark when a man goes by, the, goes by that they, they know. They bark at strangers. 
When people slander and persecute you no longer, be afraid. If you're a stranger, they naturally bark at you. Don't expect to find comforts in this world that your flesh would long for. This is our inn, not our home. Remember your greatest joy while you, for you is being a pilgrim is your God. While you're a pilgrim is, a, is your God. So we don't seek persecution, but Jesus expected us to have it when we lived under his values and under his culture. Now for me, we just need to have that challenge. Do our lives at home, at work, in our relationships, are they right before God? Do they please God? In his eyes, are we doing what he would bring pleasure to him? Now, I'm in light, in light of kind of all these people across the world that we know of that are under much persecution as Christians. Um, I met a lady recently that was imprisoned in a, from Iran because she shared her faith with an undercover uh, policeman. Um, I, I know of people in Myanmar where the, the churches are, and villages, the Christian churches and villages are under attack from the military as they're trying to eradicate Christians. Um, we know of people in, in Turkey that have been imprisoned recently, uh, leaders in Turkey that are imprisoned. So in light of that, I'm wondering what illustration can I bring from my own life? But we may not be there yet, but I do want to encourage us all to live in a way, living our values every day, that we may get opposition, that we're not compromising. So one example from my previous job, uh, I was looking after a key account, and my boss called me in. No, we, I, I got a nice order. I can't remember what it was. Uh, maybe a £30,000 order. And, uh, and my boss, and then the client, cancelled the order. And my boss said, right, I'm not having this. You need to go back to him and say, we've ordered all the stock. We've ordered all the raw materials, and we're going to bill him for £10,000. So in that moment, I thought, do I just do what everyone else does, or do I stand up for what is right? And I said to him, this is the managing director, I said, I'm not prepared to do that. I'm not going to lie to him. Um, and he was shocked, because that's what the culture was. But I thought, no, I need to bring. I didn't think this, but I was bringing a different culture. A kingdom culture and the opposition was minimal but he looked at me different he was so frustrated he was so angry he brought in my boss he even called the CEO in Netherlands to talk about this whole situation what does he do insurrection in the ranks so so um and yeah he I probably didn't get the same opportunities in that role um yeah I was I was looked at differently by my boss. But anyway, let's all be prepared for opposition as we take stand, as we live out our values each day. Finally, living with humility. Throughout this, uh, the Beatitudes, it's, it talks about humility. It comes through in all of the messaging. Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. So the ESV says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Happy are the humble, blessed are the poor, the meek, the peacemakers. Jesus demonstrated to us kingdom humility on this earth that we might follow in his footsteps. Humility says, your way is better. comes with a realisation that only when we accept that we are spiritually poor, that we're bankrupt, that we have nothing to offer, that is when we seek salvation for him. When we humbly bow the knee and seek him. Satan's kingdom promotes self-rule, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-promotion, but God's kingdom requires a humble response of repentance, bowing the knee and obediently serving him in total trust and dependence. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. 
And that is a beginning of humility to accept that we cannot save ourselves. We need to come to him. So I want you to remember that the Sermon on the Mount isn't a list of rules telling us how to behave. They're not a list of commands. It's a description of the culture that we express naturally when we're connected to the eternal Jesus. To help you remember that they're be attitudes rather than do attitudes. We are to be who Christ has made us. To live out the kingdom culture that we are in now. It's radical, it's revolutionary, it's countercultural. Tom Wright, a theologian, says this the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes are a summons to live in the present in the way that will make sense in God's promised future. We're just pulling forward the culture of heaven to now, to living out now. Live out the kingdom culture. Live out the kingdom culture's beautiful attitudes and be happy in your secured eternal joy. Remember that man does not live on bread alone, but from the words, the living words that came from God's mouth. The Beatitudes are words that came from Jesus' mouth to us. Not to be followed like a law, but to be internally digested, to be meditated on. Hide these words in your heart so that when circumstances come to us, we live out a different culture. The Holy Spirit brings forth the word in us and we live out and prompts you to live in a very distinct, different way. Some of the most powerful words that came from Jesus' lips, living words that we are to feed on, is this. And these are crucial for every person that walks on this earth. This is how you will know a happy new year, a happy new day, a happy new eternity, through these words. Jesus repeatedly said these in his ministry. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, we see that now and not yet. Repent now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, is present, is current. As my mum reminded us, God has called you into fellowship with Jesus Christ, his son. Is anyone here this morning being called by God to have fellowship with his son? I tell you, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a message I can bring to you because this is what Jesus said. This is what he requires of you to come, to humbly come, not just to see what's here on earth, but to see heaven's perspective. Humbly come now. Should we just spend a moment just before God Heavenly Father, draw us into a deeper understanding of what it is to live in the present, in light of the future. Lord, we want to live out the kingdom culture right now. Lord, I believe as we live and behave and are just your children in, under your rule, under your new way of living, people will see a unique difference. We will be that salt and that light. We want to live counterculturally, Lord. We want to live in this new revolution, Lord. We want to, don't want to just drift along with the rest of the world. We want to be caught up in your purposes, your plans. So we humbly bow the knee before you again. We know our spiritual weakness. We know we're spiritually poor on our own. But Lord, in you we're rich.
Yeah, Father, I pray that the gap between heaven and the kingdom and earth would close. We'd naturally live supernaturally. Amen.